Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. There were generals in the camp who believed that there would be a draw in this war, because the German army was strong enough to repel an invasion in the West. In this case, the Soviet Union would be left on its own and thus would be obliged to come to some arrangement with Hitler's Germany. It was also possible for an understanding to be reached with the Western powers at the cost of the Soviet Union. Both opinions came from the group of unteachables. Already in August, September 1943, I had not accepted them, but the wish was all too often the father of the thought. The Tehran Conference in December 1943 and developments in 1944 had finally put paid to such thoughts. After some earnest checks, I came to the conclusion that the war was hopelessly lost. Since my talks with Professor Arnold, I was of the opinion that Germany had begun the war without compelling reasons and thus burdened itself with a gigantic guilt. Following my own bitter experience, I had trusted Hitler and his clique when they had begun their crimes against the Sixth Army without thought that they would affect the whole of the German people. I could agree completely with the conclusions which ended the manifest of the National Committee Freeze Deutschland for the people and fatherland against Hitler and his war for immediate peace for the salvation of the German people for a free independent Germany so I joined the National Committee Freeze Deutschland though I had yet to take an active part I did not do so as I was still not quite ready I was especially strongly moved by the question of whether prisoners of war should be allowed to deal with the political and military leadership. Would this not increase the chaos? Would it not involve the disintegration of the German front? Would it not endanger the lives of many of their still fighting comrades? My oath of allegiance and the traditional concept of an officer's honor prevented me from taking this step. An important role was played by my relationship with Field Marshal Paulus whom I honored as a man and whose conduct I esteemed. Could I attack him from behind? I did not feel myself especially personally bound to the signers of the manifest, most of whom I did not know. Despite the deep impression that the personality of Wilhelm Pieck had made on me during his visit to Sustel, I was now reserved with the communists in the National Committee. These then were some of the thoughts and problems that concerned me during the weeks after the founding of the National Committee. The grounds were basically a similar conflict to that during the battle for the cauldron on the Volga. Should I follow the voice of reason and actively oppose the apocalyptic developments? Or should I follow Hitler and the oath of allegiance and in doing so participate in the catastrophe threatening my people? After the inferno of Stalingrad, I must yet turn to all the consequences of Germany's next and greatest misfortune against Hitler and his war. But apart from the understanding about the foregoing question, there was still something needed, a lot of civil courage. I had it, but not enough to be without regard for the attitude of others and my own responsibility to the National Committee Fritz Deutschland. Thus my thoughts went here and there. Evening after evening, I discussed it with the general standing nearby. I pondered and read, but came to no final decision. It was mid-August and I was taking a walk in the park. There I encountered Rosk. I have been looking for you, Adam. Do you know already that Saitlitz, Lapman, and Korfs are leaving us today? Leaving? What has Paulus to say about that, Rosk? I have not seen him yet, but you can best ask him that yourself. Paulus already knew about it. I presume, he said, it has something to do with the National Committee. Saitlitz's memorandum and his behavior in the cauldron must be known not only to many of our soldiers and officers, but especially also to the Russians and apparently also to the German immigrants. However, I am convinced that he will remain faithful to us. A tradition among old military families is that in captivity, no one ever goes against the head of state. Someone knocked. Colonel Generals Heitz and Strecker entered. Heitz came straight out with, we must form a circle around the three of them, especially as this necessary for Saitlitz as he already in the cauldron demanded Hitler's orders to be disregarded. Paulus agreed to the proposal. He did not mistrust Saitlis, but regarded the discussion as irrelevant. The opportunity for one occurred. On the 22nd August, von Saitlis had his 55th birthday. I had prepared for him a cutout relief of a tower of Sustel Monastery, 
Paulus wanted to present it with this gift on behalf of all the generals, including the Romanians and Italians. Now he decided, at the suggestion of von Heitz and Strecker, to give it to Saitlitz before his departure and to add some meaningful words. Saitlitz was delighted with the gift. He said it was especially well done and assured Paulus that he could leave those remaining to him. This tower, he concluded, will be for me the Tower of Truth. Generals von Saitlitz, Latman and Dark Horse had already gone. A new discussion arose among us as to where they could be going and what drove them. Would they keep on maintaining a distance between themselves and the National Committee Fries Deutschland? The same question arose again about 14 days later when Lieutenant General Edler von Daniels left the camp. Meanwhile, three new officers had joined us, Colonels Bo, Schildknecht, and Petzold. They came from a camp near Moscow and were bitter enemies of the National Committee. They were of the opinion that should it really be necessary to overturn Hitler, it would be the task of the German people back home and the soldiers at the front. They argued that if we prisoners of war rose up against Hitler, it would be a betrayal. That was naturally water under the bridge for the holding on with General Schlage and Heats, who still had a strong influence on the thoughts of the whole group of generals. With this assertion, it was easy to call upon such actions from the safe basis of captivity to try to discredit the aims of the National Committee. Paulus too had similar reservations that he expressed in the following manner. Must the impression not arise that such steps come from Russian pressure? Goebbels would not find it difficult to discredit the activities of the National Committee Fries Deutschland as collaboration or a stab in the back. On the 22nd August, we have been thinking about Seidlitz, where would he be spending his birthday? If in the past the relationship between Paulus and Saitlis had been troubled by individual episodes, the field marshal felt himself closely bound to the general through the old cavalry school. Standing together in this difficult time, the coarse spirit showing itself in every situation, that was Paulus's motto, hampered by one jumping off, making a breach in the general's front, with his inbuilt old officer's coarse snobbery Paulus said, Saitlitz will keep to his word several times to Colonel General Heats, who, as former president of the Rex War Court, had seen in Saitlitz a potential traitor since his revolt in the cauldron. It was a very complicated, boring, and difficult process reaching the new embankment. The expression stab in the back was used by a field marshal. He said it not to demonstrate any personal dislike of the men of the National Committee, but because he was so inclined. The stab in the back legend derived from the peculiar German responsibility for the First World War and from the shame of the November Revolution and the preparations for the War of Revenge, took a central position in the more than decisive political ideological standard equipment of a staff officer of the Weimar Republic. The old generals from Hindenburg as Reich president and others occupying decisive positions of power in the Reichswehr were not interested in the truth. They wanted to forget that the First World War had been lost for Germany through military and economic exhaustion and implied the blame lay in the betrayal of the homeland. I too during my early studies of history had, for example, never come across the text of a record of a conference at the Great Headquarters on the 14th August 1918, in which the State Secretary for Foreign Affairs, in the presence of the Kaiser, Hindenburg, Ludendorff and other leading personalities in the retinue of Wilhelm II had stated the following. The chief of the general staff of the field armies has defined the war situation that we can no longer hope to break the will for war among our enemies through warlike negotiations and that our war leadership must set the goal of gradually paralyzing the enemy's strategic defensive. The political leadership bows before this declaration by the great generals who have conducted this war and draws from this the political consequences that politically we will be unable to break the enemy's will to wage war, and that we are therefore obliged to bear the cost of the war situation under the leadership of our politicians. These words indicated quite clearly that a quarter of a year before the November Revolution, Germany was militarily and politically no longer in a position to win. To conceal the fact, the stab in the back was officially sanctioned in the Third Reich it went into the history books and professors' colleges. The November criminals were in essence national betrayers abandoned with the greatest contempt. 
This whole tangled mess of systematic drummed-in opinions and condemnations had first to be swept aside before a new way could come into sight. Certainly, there were the great historical examples of Steen, Arndt, Clausewitz, and Boyen, who appealed to the German people over the heads of treacherous despots and called for a fight for freedom. There was the Convention of Torigen of the 30th December 1812, in which the King of Prussia's General von York, without asking the King, agreed with the Russian General von Diebich to cease all hostilities between the Prussian course and the Russian units. The National Committee's manifest pointed to these historical examples. In fact, it then dealt with the essence of the same problems and similar conflicts now confronting us in 1943. The men of 1812-13 renounced their head of state and his followers and fought on their own responsibility in accordance with their knowledge and historical necessity and the people's and fatherland's wishes. The group of stubborn ones in Voikovo did not want to let it pass. These men were not prisoners of war, and anyway, they allied themselves with the Tsar and not with the Reds. This last argument was what it was really all about. The eternal conquerors and militarists among the generals did not want to have anything to do with the communists. They hated them on principle on the basis of their own class distinction. They also did not think earnestly about concerning themselves with the communist conceptions of nation, fatherland, state, and war. In the end, all went with the core spirit and officer's honor that Field Marshal Paulus, strictly within the net of this conservative upbringing, swore by. I, the colonel among generals, was caught in this jungle. Only a millimeter at a time could I extricate myself. One evening during the first days of September 1943, I was sitting reading in my room. Suddenly someone stuck their head through the door and asked me to come quickly. I threw on my uniform jacket as I went along. On the ground near the steps I came across a group of generals, among them. I could not believe my eyes. Von Sadlitz and Latman. The thought shot through my head that they had returned to Volkovo. But where was Korf's? I could not make him out. Instead I saw Colonel Steedel and a Luftwaffe major unknown to me, whom Steedel introduced as Major Von Frankenberg. Although I greeted both generals and Steedel effusively, I had the feeling that the whole group standing around, among them Colonel General Strecker, were in a state of uncertainty. General Von Sadlis asked me to report his presence to Field Marshal Paulus, which I did immediately. The conversation between Paulus and Sadlis did not last long. When I was called back by an orderly and entered the room, the Field Marshal was irritably striding up and down with long steps. Has there been another clash? I asked. No, not that. But in the few days that Saitlitz has been absent, his attitude has completely changed. He is talking about new realizations that he has had in conversation with Stalingraders, but also with recently captured officers, with German immigrants and with high-ranking Soviet officers. He is talking about the founding of a league of German officers, Bund Dutcher auf Fizier. I cannot make him out. Finally, Paulus asked that all the generals be summoned so that he could tell them what he had said to me. I agreed to his request. Go personally round to all the generals. I asked that they meet in the dining room in half an hour. The generals of the former Sixth Army were punctually on the spot. General von Sadlitz sat at his usual place, which went with the seniority of the former commanding general. Paulus asked him to speak. It was as if the dominating gold and red on the general's uniforms crackled in the assembly, as if at any moment a dangerous explosion would occur. Colonel General Heights looked around him with an angry face. Colonel Steedel and Major von Frankenberg seemed ready for him to start. General von Sadlitz went over the rapidly worsening war situation for Germany since the battle on the Volga. He referred to the long-expected landing of the Western Allies and concluded that the war was no longer winnable by Germany. I noticed how at this point a murmur went through the assembly and had the feeling that Saitlitz, who was speaking freely, was now coming to the point. One could sense that he was trying to bring his talk quickly to an end. When he called for opposition to Hitler, there was a massive counter-cry of unheard of and stop, forcing him to break off his speech. Resignedly, he sat down again, while uproar broke out around him, in which he was shocked by some personal abuse. Some generals ran to the door and wanted to leave the room. Paulus remained quiet and relaxed through all of this. 
With some appeasing words, he was able to calm down the noise and enable Major General Lapman to speak. He too recalled the German defeat at the front and the air war against the homeland. Then he recalled his own experience on the Volga. Generals and troops had no longer believed overwhelmingly in the highest commander. Hitler had sacrificed them soullessly, coerced them with lies and unrealizable promises in the painful defeat. I knew that Latman had previously been a convinced adherent of National Socialism. Now in his words was the time for the settling of accounts, the way to self-understanding. He spoke very emotionally. Hitler's brutal power that brought us and our families to the tragedy of Stalingrad will plunge the whole of the German people into a vast Stalingrad if we do not stop him. That is why generals must leave behind their reserve and involve themselves with those who think the same in the fight against Hitler. In contrast to Seidlitz, Lapman was able to end his short speech without a row, although the faces of the generals remained as grim as ever. But when Colonel Stadel then initiated the creation of the League of German officers with the goal of Hitler's downfall, in order to bring about a cessation of hostilities, the orderly withdrawal of the Wehrmacht to the rate boundaries and renunciation of all conquered territory, there was a real eruption. Any understanding was unthinkable. Colonel General Heitz even threatened to box Stiegel's ears. He shouted at Major von Frankenberg too. Next to Heitz, Rodenberg, Sixth von Arnhem, Strecker and Pfeiffer had the most to say. Seidlitz's group was accused of being traitors. Without even casting them another glance, the generals left the room complaining. Hollis was especially pained by this incident. Kitchen staff and order lies had also heard the noise. Must they, must the camp administration be offered such a display? What was played out in the dining room was more than unworthy, he said, when we returned to his room. Then the door opened and Heats, Rodenberg, Sixth von Arnhem and Strecker entered. One of them said, we refuse to exchange another word with Seidlitz or his companions. We are not going to be taught by young people like Latman, Steedl, or even this Frankenberg, added Heitz. We would like to continue the conversation not in your room but out in the park. The generals left the room with Paulus. I remained alone and thought about this lesson on coarse spirit and officer's honor. After a quarter of an hour an orderly appeared, Corporal Erwin Schult. The field marshal asked you to come down. Despite it being evening, the camp was like an agitated swarm of bees. Everything was busy. The generals were moving and gesticulating in small groups up and down the camp road. Paulus was only a few paces from me. The generals are proposing to conduct an internal discussion on the steps behind the park after breakfast tomorrow morning. All are to attend without exception. A disturbed night followed this announcement. Next morning, I was up earlier than usual. All the generals assembled punctually for breakfast. A stormy atmosphere reigned. The meal was quickly consumed. Without exception, all reached the appointed place in the park. After a short, angry discussion, Sixth von Arnhem put together the following text. 1. We refuse to have further relations with Seidlitz and his companions. No one will talk to them. Those who are accosted will go on without answering. 2. Contact between Paulus and Seidlitz will be maintained by Colonel Adam. 3. The camp administration will be written a letter in which we will protest the sojourn of the Seidlitz group and against further advertising for the German officer's lead as well as that of the National Committee Freeze Deutschland. 4. Lieutenant General Six von Arnhem is tasked with the writing of this letter. 5. The letter will be signed by all the camp's officers. In fact, all the generals signed the petition. I too added my name below theirs. I was then given the unhappy task by Paulus of handing over the petition personally to the camp commandant. I reported to him via the duty officer and was taken straight to him. The Soviet colonel took the paper without a word and I was dismissed. On my way to the camp commandant, it had dawned on me that our declaration was in fact a provocation. From Paulus too, one could see that the previous proceedings had not been pleasant. I had spoken quietly to Major von Frankenberg for a few minutes immediately after the tumultuous assembly. We also knew that members of the Seidlitz group, including such men as von Linsky, Sklomer, and von Trevor, had had short but pertinent discussions. And now this collective condemnation, this attempt at a warning to General von Seidlitz and his companions. I keep going over, Field Marshal, I said to Paulus.
whether we handled the matter correctly. Saitlitz had assured you and all of us that he had come to us on his own initiative, only following his conscience and his deep concern for Germany. No one had tasked him to do it, but we, the prisoners of war, turned in this provocative way to the Soviet side. You are right, Adam. I too have been thinking it through again. We handled it too hastily. How would a German camp commander react if a Soviet prisoner of war officer brought him such an aggressive demand? Let us wait and see what happens, said Paulus, tired by the repugnant quarrel. It came to nothing. Apparently, this display of arrogance and obstinacy by the pro-Hitler German generals had been filled with a pitying smile. For the benefit of Paulus and the decent ones among the generals, it must be said that the field marshal was later able to get the regrettable pamphlet back. It remained the only reminder of how the matter would be decided politically. General von Seidlitz and his companions left two days later. They were unable to enlist further generals for the League of German Officers. Even the catastrophe on the Volga had not yet enabled these gentlemen to distance themselves from Hitler. They still bowed down before a criminal supreme commander-in-chief and excused the betrayals that enabled further crimes. However, it was wrong to consider this leading group of the League of German officers as crazy. The unanimity, the core spirit, was only skin deep. Already the hysterical way in which the stubborn ones were proceeding gave rise to new doubts along the sober-thinking generals and myself. Who should I actually hate? Hitler and those who, after the Sixth Army had been hunted to extinction, were now preparing to lead the whole German people to the slaughterhouse. Or those who demanded that Hitler must fall so that Germany might live. I had always gone my own way. I had never forced myself but rather set my mind unreservedly to doing what I considered necessary. I had also helped others in a camaraderie manner whenever I could. Coming from a simple farming family, I had pursued my military career not through nepotism or intrigues, but rather through diligence, punctuality, reliability, and efficiency. I believed that I always had a heart for subordinate soldiers and officers, and I was also no coward when things were hard. This all belonged doubtlessly to my straight way. Since the battle of destruction on the Volga, especially after the talks that I had had in captivity with men like Professor Arnold, Wilhelm Pieck, and Lieutenant, Colonel Pussera, not least through my studying of literature, thinking and pondering, the realization grew that in my straight way, my self-deception had reached an important point. I had been cheated of any real goal along this route, over the for what and the where to. As a soldier, I obeyed orders blindly. My supreme commander, however, was Adolf Hitler, in whose hands lay immense power. An abundance of power that no German head of state had held since Kaiser Wilhelm II. This power was enforced by violence, through which the political enemies of National Socialism, Communists, Social Democrats, Liberals, and Christians were locked up in concentration camps, liquidated in cold blood, or brought to the scaffold. The majority of the people were with the help of a cunning national and social demagogy, participating in a coordinated economic phantom existence aimed at armament. Guns, tanks, bombers, fighters, submarines, and battleships were sprung from the ground. The army, air force, and navy were growing, and Hitler was becoming ever more arrogant, threatening, and powerful. Germany was spreading an atmosphere of fear and horror in the world. Never was the Fuhrer Teutonicus as much feared by other peoples as in the first ten years of the Third Reich, when Hitler's Germany believed itself militarily strong enough that over and neighboring countries, conquered them, utilized them to the utmost, and annexed them. Then came the change, which started with the defeat of the Wehrmacht in the Soviet Union during the winter of 1941-42 and was completed with the destruction of the Sixth Army on the Volga and the defeat at Kursk in the summer of 1943. No less than half a year had now passed since the last night in the cauldron, the night of the 30th 31st January 1943, when I had brooded over the questions. When did the tragedy on the Volga begin? What was my life? Germany's luck or misfortune? Now I saw things much more clearly. Above all, it was clear that Hitler's unscrupulous power and war policies were only possible because his generals had served him faithfully, obeyed him blindly and actively assisted him, as I had done on my straight way. Thus Hitler had been able to continue the pitiless war of conquest that was now striking back at the German people in frightful retribution. 
Hitler and his regime had undermined all the ethical and lawful practices of conduct between state leadership and the people, between the command of the Wehrmacht and the Wehrmacht itself. While Heitz, Schmidt, von Arnhem and other generals still regarded him as the faithful one, they were bringing severe blame on themselves, not only for the disaster that could already be seen, but for everything in particular that the Moloch of war had conjured up. My straight way now obliged me to distance myself from the generals, who had produced such an undignified paper, and whose anger against the search for a new evaluation and a new orientation was out of all proportion. In their inflexibility, it seemed, they would rather leave the world in rubble than deal with it realistically. I was ashamed of myself after the event for having signed the court spirit under the Dan collective condemnation against the leading speaker for the League of German Officers. I would never do that again. I undertook basically as before to engage myself with the work and aims of the proposed League of German Officers. Unfortunately, at this time my health was somewhat unstable and I was in the care of the doctors because of a circulatory problem. As therapy, I would have to do some light work, I thought. But that was not so easy for a staff officer or a general. The Soviet Union adhered to the Geneva Convention of 1929, according to which officers were exempt from physical labor. The Soviet camp doctor, Dr. Morov, understood my reasoning and arranged for me to have an area of grass in the park, which I then dubbed up with some of the generals. The doctor provided some seeds. Soon I was able to supplement our meals with salads, carrots, cucumbers, and herbs. The gardening helped in as much as I regained my body weight, which had been considerably reduced as a result of the troubles and deprivations in the big battle. Mainly I thank the quiet care of the camp doctor, Dartmorov, for getting me through my health crisis. But as an allotment gardener, I did not lose out on the spiritual role. In this I got myself into many controversies. I remained a busy user of the camp library. A great impression was made on me by Lenin's work imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. Nikolai Ostrovsky's How the Steel Was Hardened, Sholachov's New Land Under Plow, Alexei Tolstoy's Bread and Glakov Energy, all these helped me to recognize the deeply affecting of hevels which the Soviet Union had allowed to evolve from the rubble of the old Tsarist Russia. These books answered several of the questions that had arisen in my mind during the advance of the Sixth Army the year before, concerning the scientific laboratory in the steppe village, the mighty factories in Stalingrad, the fighting workmen of the tractor factory. Above all, the question that I had often asked myself, what gave the Soviet soldiers so much steadfastness, courage and fighting spirit, and the attributes that so astounded us and demanded such heavy casualties? Gradually, I understood that the Soviet man was conscious of the need to defend his fatherland, of conducting a justified fight against the enemy who, without declaring war, had breached a treaty and fallen on the Soviet Union on the 22nd June 1941 in order to annex the socialist state and society. In all these deliberations, I found in Lieutenant Colonel Pusarov a ready conversationalist and patient teacher. From him, I learned that Soviet soldiers and officers alike were on the whole brought up with political knowledge. They should know the whole truth about what was happening in the world around them. Every Red Army soldier, said Pusarov, knows, for example, the Soviet Union's war aims. The Red Army is fighting to drive the German invaders out of our land and to free the Soviet soil. Our fight for freedom mixes with the fighting of the people of Europe and America for their independence, for their democratic freedoms. Our war will lead to the destruction of the Hitler clique. We Soviet people nevertheless differentiate between the Hitler system and the German people. Hitler will and must be destroyed, but we hope to be able to live in friendship with the German people once more. Understand, Colonel Adam, that this is our policy. I nodded without a word. But what are the war aims of Hitler's Wehrmacht? They want not only to rob our land and our riches, but are destroying hundreds of thousands of women, children, and old people. The Soviet man is to be a subperson, stamped as of a lower race. Think of the Commissar Order. Think of the fascist mass murders that have been organized in the Soviet Union, in Poland, and in other countries, and that millions of our people have been transported to Germany to do forced labor. In view of such fascist crimes, is it not obvious where the subhumans are to be found? It is terrible, Lieutenant Colonel Pusserow. How can we Germans get out of this filth, out of this wrong? 
You can do it, you too, Colonel Adam. But you must change your views radically and not just think differently. You must fight for it, so that this filthy episode in the history of the German people at least ends quickly and a new, better Germany can be formed. I think you should begin with your own responsible political thinking and dealing to learn, and not wait for a higher rank or for orders. That is easier said than done. Do you know that in the Kaiser's army, as in the Reichswehr and the Wehrmacht, the soldier had to be unpolitical? Every political activity was forbidden to him. I know that. Many Germans say that politics will ruin a man's character. You have hit upon a remark by the great Goethe. Political song. A ghastly song. But I believe that in this case one leaves Goethe well to one side. Perhaps you are now thinking about the role of politics in your life, especially in the battle of destruction at Stalingrad. You have experienced the consequences of fascist politics painfully in your own life. Was it not a paradox that I should be taking such lessons from a staff officer in the enemy army? I admit openly that I am still thankful today to Postero and to all those who helped me to sort out my problems and to get involved in thinking in a new way. Without them, the way to the new shores would have been tedious and painful. By means of such talks and through studying the literature, I gradually saw that the series of German defeats in the Soviet Union were not primarily the result of strategic and tactical errors by the German military command, although there were errors in abundance, but rather were the lawful result of the overwhelming Soviet war leadership and the fighting morale of the Red Army as well as the patriotism of the Soviet people and their determination to defend their homeland, who won the fight through their increasing output of weapons, ammunition and supplies for the front. These factors began to play an ever greater role during the winter of 1941-42 as the Soviet Union overcame the surprise of the German onslaught. So from 1942 onwards, they were able to exploit the full mobilization of all their forces. The first great result of this was the German defeat on the Volga and the collapse of the Southern Front in 1942-43. Again the waves rose in Voikopo camp as the news spread of the founding of the League of German Officers. On the 11th and 12th September 1943 more than a hundred delegated officers from five countries, as well as members of the National Committee Fries Deutschland and a row of guests gathered in Lunyovo near Moscow. The severe German disasters on all fronts had given a group of senior officers the last incentive to take part in the Fries Deutschland movement. The initiative of the German Communist Party and its Central Committee, as well as the National Committee, had enabled the officers to found their own organization attached to the Fries Deutschland movement. This had given their movement a wider basis, and it had fallen on fruitful ground. In Voikovo, following the visit of Generals von Sadlitz and Latman, Colonel Stadel and Major von Frankenberg, we were not unprepared. The condemning verdict had made things quite clear. Now it was known that General von Seidlitz had been voted president of the League of German Officers, with General Edler von Daniels, Colonel Stadel and Van Hooven as vice presidents. Major, Generals Dark Course and Latman were also on the committee. In order to ensure constant cooperation between the National Committee and the Board of the League of German Officers, a few days later, General von Seidlitz was voted vice president of the National Committee. Apart from this, the National Committee Fries Deutschland was enlarged by Daniels, Latman, Darkhorst, and a few other officers. As we discovered this from the newspaper Fries Deutschland, the cries of the leading group in Voikovo broke out again. They arranged a fresh statement about Seidlitz, Daniels, Kors, and Latman. Old Pfeffer burst out angrily, by doing so, they have finally distanced themselves from us. We will have nothing more to do with them and will boycott them should we meet them. Paulus, von Lenski, Wolves, and I did not agree with this complaint. Paulus looked through it to ensure that he and Pfeffer were not shown as an agreement with the threatened boycott. The League of German officers turned to tasks and target setting so that a deep consciousness of duty and feeling of responsibility for our people towards every German officer might check the catastrophe threatening Germany. In conformity with the analysis of the National Committee, the League of German Officers declared, the war has become meaningless and hopeless. Its continuance lies exclusively in the interest of Hitler and his regime. Consequently, the National Socialist Government, which is acting against the will of the people and the nation, will never be ready to allow the opening of the way that alone can lead to peace. 
This recognition forces us to declare a fight against Hitler's criminal regime and for the creation of a government with sufficient means of power with which, as seen from our side, peace and a happy future for our fatherland can be assured. With this special appeal, the six army surviving combatants turned to the German generals and officers, the people and the Wehrmacht. All Germany knows what Stalingrad means. We went through hell. We were declared dead and have arisen to a new life. We can no longer say nothing. We have more than anyone the right to speak, not only in our own names, but in the names of our dead comrades and all the victims of Stalingrad. That is our right and our duty. In the newspaper phrase Deutschland, I read with close attention the speech that Major General Lapman had made at the founding conference of the League of German officers. He spoke about the oath of allegiance. Like so many others, this question had greatly moved me at the time. Generations of German officers had sworn the oath to the head of state as the highest attribute of a soldier's honor. Were there any grounds that vindicated breaching the oath? Lapman went from the ethical content of the oath to the relationship between the Führer and the follower that the oath made reciprocally binding. He recalled the order by a commanding general not long before the conclusion of the fighting in the cauldron. The Führer has ordered that we should fight to the last. God orders my men. In this way, tens of thousands fulfilled their oath to the utmost. But how far can this loyalty be taken? If one thinks this loyalty through to the end, said Lapman, then one comes to the conclusion. Even if Germany goes under, the oath of allegiance remains undamaged. In this extreme consequence lies the justification for describing the further binding of the oath as immoral. As we are of the view that any further fighting will lead to the destruction of our German people, we see under quite different conditions the oath to the person of Adolf Hitler to be null and void. While Hitler knew that our promise bound us to him, he could contrive plans that must make him the greatest of all Germans. It was for this idea that the expensive blood of our comrades had been sacrificed, not for Germany any longer. Was this not an abuse of our loyalty? Was it not the abusing of a right that he was exploiting from our ethical belief in the wording of the oath? Lapman continued, We never took this oath to make him or ourselves lords of Europe. We swore by God to be entirely loyal if a war for Germany arose. He, however, whose loyalty we praised, turned this oath into a lie. Now, however, we ask our people to be even more compliant. It was a clean, earnest discussion that impressed me deeply. The speeches by Colonel Van Hooven and Steedel, as well as that by General von Seelitz, also had the honorable intention of saving Germany before it was too late. A few days later, the resolution of the National Committee and the Board of the League of German Officers was published orderly retreat of the army to the Reich boundaries under responsible leaders contrary to Hitler's orders. This meant that the Wehrmacht should return to the Reich's borders under the command of its generals against Hitler's orders, thus making it known that they distanced themselves from Hitler's plans of conquest, and as the strongest bearers of arms in Germany wanted to thus return to peace. The National Committee and the lead of German officers constantly repeated their demands of September 1943 by means of loud hailers, leaflets, personal letters, broadcasts, and the newspaper Phrase Deutschland. The following appear in a central leaflet of October 1943. The National Committee has come to the following decision. There is no way of saving the army other than by an orderly withdrawal to the Reich boundaries. However, there can be no orderly withdrawal without the removal of Hitler as supreme commander. The Wehrmacht will pull out of Hitler's army, without and against Hitler, or they will not return at all. Therefore, the leadership of the National Committee Frees Deutschland turns to the generals, demand and proclaim Hitler's removal, the criminalizer of the Reich and Wehrmacht, as commander-in-chief. Take your troops back in an orderly manner. Take care that your soldiers do not take matters into their own hands and flee home demoralized. To the officers and men, demand the immediate withdrawal of the army. Be conscious that you are to be the weapons bearers for the freedom of our new Germany. Complying with this solution meant, both politically and militarily, a great chance for Germany. A national catastrophe would be averted, millions of human victims spared, the destruction of German cities avoided. The world had evidence that in Germany itself, there were the strongest forces that could, albeit belatedly, end Hitler's regime and policies. 
the starting point for a peace treaty and the formation of a new Germany would be incomparably more favorable than would be the case if the war continued. The National Committee frees Deutschland and the League of German officers were heard on the German front and partly also in Germany. The autumn had started cold and unfriendly. Only seldom could one now sit on a bench in the park. Our daily walks became shorter. The gardening work for this year was also over. Therefore, to fill my time, I carved chess figures, cigarette holders, tobacco pipes, and other things that gave small pleasures here and there. Out of the paper from cigarette packets, we made playing cards so that we could play scat or other card games in the long evenings. Several hours of the day were spent on books, including well-spirited and political literature, as well as on learning the Russian language, to which the Soviet camp interpreter gave us a friendly introduction. However, the question that was burning in my soul found no answer that way. What was happening at home? What about our loved ones? My fundamental mood was perfectly summed up by these lines from Heinrich Hein. I think of Germany in the night, and then I fall asleep. General Hans Wolz, the former artillery commander of the 4th Corps, left us at this time. He had disconnected himself from the false community of resisting generals in Vojkovo and went to Luyovo, the seat of the National Committee Fries Deutschland. Surprisingly, Generals Rosk and Rovenberg also went off on journeys. I learned from Rosk that he too had decided for the League of German Officers. Nevertheless, in our talks within a small group, he maintained a pertinent, reasonable behavior. Actually, he had also made contact with the National Committee, but then became sick and returned to Vojkovo. He also confirmed that Rodenberg had joined the League of German Officers and was working together with Saitlitz and Luniovo. That hit the camp like a bomb. Rodenberg, a bastion of the war extenders, a member of the League of German Officers, had he really made up his mind? Later, Lieutenant General Rodenberg turned out to be an accomplice of SS Obersturm Bamfer, Lieutenant Colonel Huber, who had been taken prisoner as commander of a unit on the Volga. He had stood out at the Yellow Buda camp as a member of the National Committee. Rodenberg and Huber in the summer of 1944 had wanted Captain Stoles and Lieutenant Dar Wilemse, who had been given a National Committee document, to be released to go over to the Wehrmacht. They were to give the Gestapo details about the work, composition, and location of the National Committee. The next well-camouflaged attempt, which could be covered through the regard the Soviet government had for the National Committee, was able to be foiled. The main responsibility for this attempted diversion fell on General Rodenberg, and he was banished from the lead of German officers. Fully unexpectedly, the group of obstinate generals lost their spokesman. Colonel General Heats, the tough soldier with the sound appetite, who covered five kilometers every day in the camp, some of it at the trot, had become ill. Following a temporary recovery, his condition deteriorated. He became completely emaciated. Professors from Ivanovo and Moscow were summoned. They confirmed cancer. The colonel general was conveyed to a hospital in Moscow, but he could not be saved. The disease had already spread too far, and he died soon afterwards. In the spring of 1944, I got to know my friend Arno von Linsky in the League of German Officers. He was generally, and by me particularly, regarded as a man of outstanding character, always open-minded and warm-hearted towards those who found themselves in real difficulty. He was also sincere and open in his assessment of those who remained overbearing in age, lies and perniciousness, and misused the real arguments. A former cavalry officer, himself coming from an old officer family and often connected with the Prussian-German army, Major General von Linsky had found it particularly difficult, as a man of strongly rooted beliefs, to take such a revolutionary step. That he did so underlined, however, his spirit and nature, his worldliness and his critical ability. For me, Arno von Linsky was the best of comrades in the spiritually difficult moral conflicts of this time a man whose participation and sympathy I could depend on in every difficult situation. He, like me, had watched the war situation for Germany constantly worsen since the founding of the National Committee and the League of German Officers. On the 6th November 1943, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was reconquered by Soviet troops. Italy had already surrendered unconditionally on the 3rd September 1943. 
On the 26th, November 1943, a salute was fired in Moscow to celebrate the liberation of Gommel. In January 1944, the Red Army broke through the German front in great depth near Leningrad, at Nakarod, on the Ilmen Lake, and at Volcha, respectively. At the end of January 1944, the National Committee Freeze Deutschland had analyzed the situation at the front in detail in a full session. Together with Linsky, I studied the speeches and resolutions of this meeting. What enlightened me above all was Walter Albrecht's shrewd comparison with the situation in 1918, which I essentially already knew from his October 1943 article in the Fries Deutschland newspaper. How was the situation with the German army at the beginning of this winter? He asked. Hitler has almost run out of reserves. In addition to this, the Luftwaffe is so weakened that it is completely incapable of protecting the German industrial areas. Without doubt, Germany's situation and that of the German army are worse than in 1918. Then he cited a description that Field Marshal von Hindenburg had given in his book For My Life. The then chief of the general staff of the field army had written, Ever smaller is the number of German troops, ever larger are the gaps in the defensive positions. We have no new forces to deploy like the enemy. Instead of a fresh America, we have only exhausted allies and they are close to collapsing. How much longer will our front be able to bear this vast stress? I asked the question, the most difficult of all questions. When must we come to an end? Hindenburg saw no more possibility than of winning the war. He also knew that the allies were declining to conduct negotiations with Kaiser Wilhelm II and the then war government. Together with Ludendorff, he demanded the immediate formation of the new government, which he confirmed in his book with the following words. All of this compels me and forces the decision to seek an end. That is an honorable end. No one will say, too soon. The retreat of the Kaiser's government in 1918 had to wait some time. Meanwhile, the military collapse was ever more obvious. Walter Ulbricht established that Hindenburg, who was thoroughly loyal to the Kaiser, still had the courage to show his supreme commander the bankruptcy of his war policy and to demand the formation of a new government that Germany's enemies would be prepared to deal with. The same demand had already long stood before Hitler's army leaders, who had the power in their hands to tumble the Hitler government in accordance with the will of the people and the army. Walter Ulbricht concluded his contribution with the words, The united and courageous people and army are dealing through the National Committee Freeze Deutschland in order to make it possible to overturn the Hitler government and achieve peace on the basis of freedom and the national independence of our German people. As little as von Lenski or even Paulus, could I talk about Ulbricht's comparison with 1918? To close this argument, we were painfully disappointed at not detecting any strong echo, nor any earnest consequences on the part of an army commander or other high Wehrmacht commander. They seemed to want to go on serving Hitler to a total catastrophe for the people and army. This fact must also have an effect on the work of the Fries Deutschland movement. The generals who remained openly faithful to Hitler did not think that it was possible for the Wehrmacht to make an orderly withdrawal to the rate borders to enable a ceasefire. The former solution could therefore not be repeated, in order at least to save the lives of many officers and soldiers and to shorten the hopelessly lost situation while daily streams of blood and millions of material assets still contributed to the continuation of the war, the National Committee Freeze Deutschland set up a new resolution. Suspension of the fighting and defecting to the side of the National Committee Freeze Deutschland. At first glance, I was alarmed when I read the National Committee's altered resolution. Did it not mean a disbandment of the front, a call for disintegration? the creation of chaos. I bore these questions day and night around with me and spoke to Lenski and Paulus about them, but then came to the conclusion that this solution of the National Committee offered a practical way out for the comrades at the front. Chaos and the disintegration of the Wehrmacht had been going on for a long time. This was not because of the National Committee, but was exclusively the fault of Hitler and his holding on generals. Whoever wanted to save themselves on the Eastern Front must break through in the way advised by the Fries Deutschland movement. Yet another question concerned me. In December 1943, the heads of state or heads of the governments of the Soviet Union, the USA, and Great Britain met in Tehran. 
The determination of the Allies to fight on until Hitler's Germany surrendered unconditionally drove the diehards of Vojkovo into a fury once more. On revised grounds, they sought to shift the blame for this decision from the German fascists to the National Committee. But who was actually conducting the war? The Hitler Wehrmacht or the National Committee Freeze Deutschland? Who had changed its whole character, Goebbels or Weiner? Gradually, such stupid, hateful blackening of the last remains of traditional cohesion tore a rift between von Linsky, me, and several other searchers on one side and the majority of the incorrigibles among the generals in Vojkovo on the other. Certainly, it was not easy for us to look stark reality in the eye. But what else could we expect after all that had happened? We also had no rights or guarantees to demand. I myself was nevertheless of the firm opinion that unconditional surrender did not mean the destruction or enslavement of the German people, but rather getting rid of the Hitler state, the Hitler Wehrmacht and Hitler politics forever. After von Linsky had left Vojkovo, Paula said to me, Now I am anxious to know what you are up to. Actually, you should have gone with von Linsky. I know though, why you are staying. I too have become cleverer during the last year. If you want to join the League of German Officers, then don't let me hold you back. We will always remain what we were in the years of fighting and conflict together, good friends. I would only leave you, Field Marshal, if I was urgently required elsewhere. For both of us it came sooner than expected. At the beginning of July 1944 I was taken to Krasnogorsk. A few days after my arrival, a transport arrived with officers who had been captured in the Crimea. Among others, I got to know the first general staff officer of an infantry division, whose name I have since forgotten. Above all, I wanted to know from him what effect the fall of the 6th Army at Stalingrad had on the German people. Officially, you are all dead. Hitler himself has said that often enough. At the beginning of February the year before last, there were three days of general mourning. The state radio broadcast the report of a German pilot who had flown over Stalingrad in the last hours. He had observed how the department store in whose cellar Paulus was sitting with the army staff had been blasted to pieces. A further visible explosion had darkened the sky. In illustrated newspapers, there appeared drawings of Paulus and some staff officers, surrounded by the dead, joining in the fight with machine pistols to the last bullet. Your superior was depicted in many speeches, press reports and radio broadcasts with a halo around him. We all wanted to avenge your deaths. Yes, so you say. But did word not trickle through that Paulus, Saitlitz, Daniels, and many others were still alive? Yes, of course, replied the Aya. But first gradually and only one at a time. The whole truth about the fate of the Sixth Army is hardly known by anyone at home today. What is known comes from the activity of the National Committee, Fries Deutschland. But we have been writing regular postcards home for one and a half years, I returned. I happen to know that they do arrive in Germany. Perhaps you can remember the former adjutant of the 11th Corps. He was head of the final staff in Stalingrad. In confidence, he told me that on Hitler's orders, the postcards from the Stalingrad prisoners of war may not be delivered to their relatives. They are lying in a Spandau fort. That is indeed a complete secret. I am very sorry. But you cannot say anything about this in Vojkovo camp, where some of the generals obstinately assert that the Russians would hold back the cards. During the time of my stay in Krasnogorsk, there also occurred a personal encounter with Otto Rule, my later friend and co-author of this book. I was on a stroll through Camp 27 when I was greeted by a young officer. From his dialect, I believed I recognized a fellow Hessian, and I asked him where he came from. He announced that he was a born Schwabian, we had often been not far from each other in the cauldron, he being at the main dressing station of the 305th Infantry Division, the Bowdoin Sea Division, later at Field Hospital in Stalingrad Center, myself at Army Headquarters. From Otto Rujol, I then discovered that on the 30th January 1943, he had been taken prisoner on the other side of Red Square, about 300 meters from the department store. He had already joined the National Committee Fries Deutschland a year ago, I was happy to get to know this sympathetic Wurttemberger, not knowing that four years later he would become a close friend. I was waiting for a talk with my friend Arno von Linsky, with whom I wanted to briefly discuss my joining the League of German Officers. 
During a year and a half of captivity, I had learned that many apparently simple things needed his attention. Budiev was the often heard Russian expression for it, so I was patient, spending my time reading, going for walks, chatting. On the 21st July 1944, I was already sitting at the open window of my room when I heard that the prisoners of war were to assemble on the camp street. I went out into the open air and sat on a bench next to the entrance to the blockhouse in which I lived. The interpreter excitedly appeared with a copy of Pravda before him and read with a loud voice that on the 20th July a bomb attack had been made on Hitler. During a conference at the headquarters near Lutzen, Colonel Graf Schenk von Stauffenberg had detonated a bomb. Hitler and several generals were lightly wounded. General Schmunt was dead. Like all the assembled prisoners of war officers and soldiers, I held my breath. Stauffenberg I knew fleetingly from a visit to the staff of the 6th Army. At the mention of his name, I jumped up and got closer to the interpreter so that I did not miss a word. So, the thought went through my head. There are forces in the homeland who are drawing conclusions about Hitler's catastrophic policies and are taking action. I was inwardly happy that resistance against Hitler should become apparent in the homeland in this way. And at the League of German Officers, I waited intently for further news. Moreover, I was happy that among the rebels, in addition to Stauffenberg, were such men as Field Marshal von Witzleben, Colonel General Beck, Generals Felgebel and Ulbricht, and Colonels Fink, Mertz von Kornheim and others. I was disappointed that Hitler, with those generals and officers, as well as the SS, hit back so relatively weakly at the resistance and dealt with the conspirators bloodily. The rebels' main error was doubtless that they believed they could dispose of Hitler in a small coup, in contrast to the National Committee Fries Deutschland, which saw in the mass of the people and the army the forces to overthrow Hitler and form a truly national, peace-loving and democratic Germany.